Welcome to the second lesson on blood moons from Root Source. My name is Bob O'Dell and this second lesson is entitled Origins. Said last time that we were talking about science, we're going to talk about science, history, and the Bible. And this time, in this lesson, we're going to focus on, on history. How do we really see it through God's eyes? And we're going to try to practice that in this lesson. Would you agree that the Bible is God's story? Okay, yeah, pretty obvious. Uh, would you agree, though, that God speaks through people in the Bible? In, in other words, he doesn't uh, send his writings to us, you know, that comes up on a boat on the shore. It, it, it's penned by people. Do you agree? Okay. And would you agree that those people who have penned the scriptures, both old and new, have a story also. They have their story. Do you agree? Okay, with me. And would you then agree that the Bible usually covers those stories in significant detail? Usually. Certainly major players that are uh, bringing a great change into the world. Like, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't just have Moses bringing the tablets down from Mount Sinai. You, you get the backstory. You get the whole story about how the children of Israel are going to uh, Egypt. Uh, take David. You don't just get the story of him coming king. You, you start with him being the shepherd boy, being called in, and, you know, and so forth. All right. So the history, see if you've guessed this, the history that we need to talk about first is what are the origins of the discovery of the blood moons? What is the story? See, but when it comes to any new teaching being offered in the Christian community, we cannot separate the messenger from the message. You agree? Uh-oh. <laughs> oh no. What about me? Uh, I'll try to do it as fast as I can. And today I'd like to cover that in just this respect. A uh, little bit of my history with astronomy. It said earlier I was an astronomy enthusiast. So let me explain that. Um, okay, this was the first constellation I ever saw up in the sky that, that I had seen on a, on a star chart. Uh, it was the, the Northern Cross. Did I think that was significant at the time? No. I was uh, 15 years old and I was interested in science. I was good in math and science and so forth. Now, I got into photography early. I uh, started photographing the moon. I was fascinated for some reason by these thin moons. Uh, and I even went so far as to seek out these things called young moons uh, to, to see how thin of a crescent you could possibly see. This one is about 28 hours old uh, from when it was completely dark. This is about 24 hours old. You've probably never seen a moon this thin. You have to know exactly where to look. Uh, this is about 24 hours old. I think my best was around 18, but I don't have a photograph of that. Even in Florida, before I came to Texas, I got involved in a thing called grazing occultations, where the moon is passing over a star or a planet, but right on the very edge. The star goes out when it goes behind a mountain on the moon, and then it pops on when it comes into a valley, and then it pops off again. I've done some of these grazing occultations at some unusual places. I don't have time to tell a story of the, my uh, Everglades story, but it is one of my favorites. I hope I can get to it at some point. I've done a lot of things uh, in astronomy. I've been showing mainly moon things. This is Halley's Comet. I, I was president of the Austin Astronomical Society back in the 80s when this came. and uh, There's a story about creating a traffic jam at 4 a.m., uh, <laughs> but I don't have time to tell that. But you know, things changed for me. Over time, I drifted away from observational astronomy. I kind of lost my, my, my love of the science. And I was really bothered by the godless nature of the astronomical community. And finally, years later, I decided to walk away. I even wrote a letter to a few 
uh, my astronomy friends on uh, September 3rd of 2012 and I said that after 30 years of reading magazines, attending these clubs, I'm moving on to a more fascinating field of study, study and that's the Bible. And my point in that letter was that there's treasures in the Bible. It is, it is a treasure field and there is beauty there and there's mystery and wonder. I was going to st stop doing anything with astronomy in order to go even more fully into the Bible. I'd already fallen in love with, with God's Word by that time. And what was bothering me, as I alluded to, I wrote this, I'm tired of the constant assertion that life sprung into existence on the earth and evolved into higher and higher forms of life on its own, and that everyone who considers another possibility is a science hater. So essentially I'm saying I'm done. Then my sister called in November of 2012 and she said, um, I visited Cornerstone Church today in San Antonio and I heard a teaching by John Hagee on something he calls the, the blood moons or something. You, you better check it out. You know what I did? Absolutely nothing. I had made my decision. <laughs> so I think in Christmas time or whatever, my sister uh, handed me the DVDs from that talk. <laughs> and, um, and then finally, on January 21st, like three months later, I watched one of the DVDs. And then on the next day, I went to the eclipse tables on the NASA website, which I had done in the past, years ago. And I saw this, that the solar eclipse in the middle of the blood moons was going to touch the North Pole for two minutes on the first day of spring. And I knew this was going to be rare. I didn't know how rare at that time, but it must be extremely rare. And for that to be also combined on the day that Israel begins its uh, religious new year. When I think about John Hagee and his you know, tagline there was blood moons, something is about to change. I had to say, yeah, something is about to change. Me. I had handed astronomy over to the atheists and walked away, and it was time for me to repent and give astronomy back to its rightful owner, God. So, I began to look into this topic again. But would the blood moons withstand my kind of scrutiny? I've spent a number of years in this area and I wasn't going to make up my mind in advance. I wanted to let the evidence lead and draw conclusions from the evidence. So this story we're going to uh, need to pick up another time because we need to talk about the real stars, which are the people that uh, discovered this. So what is the history? The, what are the origins of the initial discovery? Who, when, where, and how? And what should we be looking for in a discoverer's story? I would suggest these things, that we should be looking for a few principles. The first is that God relishes using the unlikely person, uh, David. King David, the unlikely, right? Um, uh, and then we have also the likely who's used in unlikely ways. Moses is, is an example of that. Uh, grew up in privilege, but yet ended up, his story was very unlikely in the way that uh, God used him. The same thing with Paul, you know, Pharisee of Pharisees, but, uh, but uh, God used him in an unlikely way. Second, we need to look for a period in a person's life where there's lots of time that's passed that passes with struggles and testing. Another is that there should be something in this person's heart that God really likes. David, man after God's own heart, it says. Um, Moses, most humble man on the face of the earth. Job, the most righteous man on the face of the earth. And finally, the overall arc of the story must bring glory to God's name 
more than anything else. This explains, I think, why God relishes using the unlikely. Now, don't hear me say that he only uses the unlikely, okay? But he relishes when it happens like that. So let's take a look at the blood moons. The blood moons were discovered by Mark Biltz in March 2008 after seeing what was he doing. He was looking on his computer and he was watching a total lunar eclipse, sort of a live feed or whatever, over the Temple Mount in Israel. And he was, yeah, he did this on, on the internet. That eclipse I looked up and it was uh, February 21st, 2008. And then he said in March he began uh, looking, he you know, started wondering how often do you have an eclipse like this and one thing led to another and then he discovered he saw that there were four blood moons coming in 2014 and 2015 and then he started asking, hmm, I wonder if that's ever happened before and he went back and he looked in the past and then he saw this correlation. That was the, that was the seed of, of this whole thing. So God relishes using the unlikely person. Is Mark Biltz an unlikely person? Let's see. Well, he says in his book, he worked in a roofing manufacturing job for a while. He worked in, with Brinks Home Security Sales. And the reason he got interested in Jewish things was only after his wife bought him a book by a rabbi. And that was a turning point for him. And one thing led to another. And uh, now he pastors a church in Tacoma, Washington. I'd say it's pretty unlikely. Okay. Lots of time passes, struggles, and testing. He writes in his book that in 1975, at the age 19, I got saved. And for the next 18 years, I did as much volunteer work for God as I could possibly do. He wasn't a pastor. He said, but I had reached the point when I was totally burned out on the church. And it was at that point that his wife brought him the rabbi book. So we definitely have a period, a long period of waiting and being tested. Okay, so we have the idea that there exists something in their heart that God really likes. Here's what I see. I see in Mark Builds a huge excitement for God's creation. And I think that God loves that about him. You go back to his videos where he's explaining this back in 2008, 2009, 2010, and he's talking about these moons and uh, what he sees, and, uh, and there's a love of God there. Other thing is, I would say Mark has an uncommon openness to share his discoveries with others. You know, he didn't hold on to it, work for three years to put out the book, and then surprise everybody with that. He began talking about it openly to anyone that would listen. Why? Probably because of this first one. He has a huge excitement for God's creation. I think God appreciates both, those, both of those characteristics of him, and I hope that those things never change in his life. Finally, the overall arc of the story must bring glory to his name and more than anything else. We're going to need to save this for later in this course because we've got more background to cover. Ultimately, we'll not know this for some period of time, but I will make a projection of what I think the overall arc of the story is. And your hint here is to point out that he does have Jewish heritage. He, claim, he says uh, that he has Jewish heritage on his father's side. Now, does all this prove anything about the blood moons? No, it doesn't prove anything. But there are no red flags in his storyline. It does seem consistent with the principles of how God uses people. Now, if the blood moons were discovered in 2008 and Mark was sharing that openly, it's interesting that even as late as 2013, there was hardly anything on the internet that you could search 
but there was this page from Bill Koenig's website that told some of that story and I think that's important. Now let's move to John Hagee. John Hagee heard about the blood moons in 2012, that would be early 2012 I believe, and he heard about them directly from Mark while he was attending uh, a, a Night to Honor Israel event, which is a Kufi, Christians United for Israel event, that, uh, and, and that was being put on by Mark's church in Tacoma, Washington. Now, John greatly expanded the reach of the blood moons. He has nationwide resources, worldwide resources, and this deserves thanks perspectives about these uh, two fine men. They each share an appreciation for God's covenant to Israel, and they each have put strong effort behind that belief. So there's another player in this story, Mark Hitchcock. He's a well-known prophecy writer, and he wrote the first book that says that the blood moons don't mean what John and Mark think it means. Uh, in fact, he, what, basically, he says that they don't make their case for tying the blood moons to the second coming or other prophetic end times events. And Mark's not alone in that. In fact, he even references Jack Kilby uh, in that book. I'd like to make a couple of comments about this. First of all, Mark's book is respectful. And I think he should be commended. And if, and if you ever want to write a book to explain that someone isn't making their case, go get Mark's book and read it as a way to do that. And as far as this statement that he's making, we're going to have to get into this in more detail. So, and ultimately, I want you to decide. But for right now, I've got another point to make, and that is that in things like this, don't we just immediately jump to the idea of who's right and who's wrong. But I think there's a different way to look at it, and I think that that is not the ultimate question to ask. You see, I have an opinion that we do a great injustice to our Christian brothers and sisters when we focus on picking winners and losers, rather than trying to look for God's heart in each argument. Uh, well, are you part of this story? Have you looked at this uh, topic and you might have something to uh, add to the discussion? You know, see, the good news is that even though my list here incomplete, God's list is. And nobody that serves God, that does work for him, will go unrewarded. But who's missing from this story? How about Jewish rabbis, Jewish teachers? from Israel or, or from the streams of Judaism. It's really a glaring omission. Wouldn't you think that there would have been uh, rabbis or they've got to have noticed eclipses on these uh, feast days and thought about it. What about the Jewish navigators and astronomers that were, that were figuring out the phases of the moon and when eclipses were gonna happen and so forth? Without a doubt, this topic must have been considered at some level. And just unfortunately, we just don't have any written records of what conclusions they came to. So history, what are the origins of the initial discovery? Who, when, where, and how? We've done that. Okay, but because I've just given the check mark to this background, I'd just like to mention that Avi Lipkin is an Israeli Jewish teacher on root source, and he has a course called The Five Deceptions of Islam. And he looks at the origins of Islam and the origins all the way back through Ishmael uh, from the scriptures. And his view on this topic is fascinating. He does a, a tremendous job looking at the origins and the conclusions are gonna be somewhat different from what you just heard me reach. We're gonna start the next lesson and jump right into two surprises. Well, this lesson has been brought to you by Root Source. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you next time.